After this, Pharnabazus, in fear that the Greek army might carry on a campaign against his own land, sent to Anaxibius, the Spartan admiral, who chanced to be at Byzantium, and asked him to carry the army across, out of Asia, promising to do everything for him that he might require. Anaxibius accordingly summoned the generals and the captains to Byzantium and gave them promises that if they crossed over, the soldiers would have regular pay. The rest of the officers replied that they would consider the matter and report back to him. But Xenophon told him that he intended to part company with the army at once and wanted to sail home. Anaxibius, however, bade him cross over with the others and leave them only after that. Xenophon said, therefore, that he would do so. We'll break that all down in a second, but first, a warm welcome to the final installment of this mini-series on Xenophon's Anabasis. So, will Xenophon find his way home at last? What will happen to the thousands of men still left in the army? These and other questions soon to follow. I'm Alex Petkus, you're listening to The Cost of Glory, where it is our mission ultimately, to retell all of Plutarch's lives, the biographies of the greatest and most famous heroes of the pre-Christian world of antiquity. But in my research, I come across a lot of other great books and great stories that are fitting into the purpose of trying to improve ourselves with these great heroes. So I'm sharing highlights with you. One final installment of Xenophon's Anabasis, book seven of seven. So, all right, you remember the end of last episode, our heroes, our uh, main characters, the army Xenophon, they arrive at Chalcedon, or yeah, let's just call it Chalcedon. It's spelled and pronounced in various ways. Uh, can, becomes a famous place later in late antiquity. But uh, for now, where is Chalcedon? It's it's on the eastern shore of a strait called the Bosporus which is the northern, there's two straits that separate the Aegean Sea from the Black Sea. And the the northernmost one, the one right next to the Black Sea, as opposed to the one next to the Aegean, that's called the Bosporus. And that's where, uh, on the other side, on the western side of that strait, is a little town called Byzantium that eventually became Constantinople. As I'm recording this, yesterday was the 500 and... 70th, I believe, anniversary of the capture of Constantinople by the Turks in 1453. So that's where Chalcedon is. That's where they are. And at the beginning of this chapter, Pharnabazus, who is the Persian satrap of this region of uh, Hellespontine Phrygia, uh, he urged the Spartan navarch, the admiral, Anaxibius, to get these Greeks out of his territory. He doesn't want them raiding and pillaging anymore. And across the straits, that's not his turf anymore. So he's trying to get the Spartans to to get them out of there. What's the situation with the Spartans and the Persians right now? Well, it's kind of unclear. So the Spartans enlisted the Persians' help, the Persian king's help to help them defeat the Athenians at the end of the Peloponnesian War. Persian gold paid for the ships that Lysander used to defeat the Athenian navy. And now the Spartans are kind of trying to keep peace with the Persians. They were sort of, I mean, they were allies for a while, but, you know, everybody knows that they're not like chums permanently. So that's the situation going on. Anaxibia is trying to keep the peace. So he invites Xenophon across the straits to Byzantium, which is a city that Sparta controls now. It's a former Athenian uh, colony, former Athenian uh, ally, at least. Uh, but the the Spartans are the new hegemonic power in town. And it's going to be an ongoing point of uncertainty for Xenophon and the Greeks as this chapter goes on. What do the Spartans really want to do? We talked about this broader political situation in the life of Lysander, so check that out if you want to know more. But let's get into the, the story here. So the Greeks get approached, as this is all going on, by a guy named Suthes. Uh, actually an emissary from Suthes. Suthes is a Thracian, a local Thracian. Xenophon turns him down, but remember this guy. Suthes is going to come back again. But at Byzantium, they cross over to Byzantium when the weather allows, and 
an incident occurs when they cross over to Byzantium. And I think this is a really interesting incident to go into. I like the detail here because this is the sort of thing that you often read about in sources and it could be passed over in like two sentences in a normal history account. But here Xenophon really gives you a zoom in and tells you what happened. Uh, you get to see ways that this uh, situation could have gone wrong. And basically it's an example of a not very competent handling of a situation diplomatically here. So here's what happens. They get to Byzantium and they're in the city and then the Spartans disappoint. I'll just read the passage for you here. After this, all the soldiers came over to Byzantium and Anaxibius would not give them pay. So he promised to pay them, right? And he would not give them pay, continuing on. But he made proclamation that the troops were to take their arms and their baggage and go forth from the city, saying that he was going to send them back home and at the same time make an enumeration of them. At that, the soldiers were angry, for they had no money with which to procure provisions for the journey, and they set about packing up with reluctance. Xenophon, meanwhile, since he had become a friend of Cleander, remember Cleander from the last episode, the Spartan governor of Byzantium, well, since he had become a friend of Cleander, continuing on here, he called to take leave of him, saying that he was to sail at home once. And Cleander said to him, Do not do so. If you do, said he, you will be blamed, for even now certain people are laying it to your charge that the army is slow about moving away. So, the soldiers are upset, and they're being asked to leave Byzantium, and Exibius tells them, you have to go to a place called the Kersonese, the Thracian Kersonese, which means peninsula. And that's about a several days journey away and it's hostile territory and the Greeks have no money. So essentially you're going to have to go march to this other place and where there's pay and work for you there. But in order to get there, I'm not going to pay you. You're basically just going to have to plunder and steal and fight your way there to get whatever food and supplies you need. Uh, so they're they're pretty upset, and Anaxibius orders them to leave the city, and they're all mustering outside of the city. And as this is going on, he starts to address them, and some soldiers, when they realize they're not going to get, not only are they not going to get paid, they're not going to get sent home. They're they're being ordered to basically, you know, take a hike and trust this guy's word, which has just been shown to not be that valuable, that there's going to be pay after, after a whole lot of suffering on their part. Well, some of them decide to rush back into the city because the gate is still open. And there's a couple of Spartans there at the gate waiting to shut the gate when the last man leaves. And a mob mad dash occurs, a stampede as the whole army just stops listening to Anaxibius and the soldiers charge back in and they decide Effectively, they're going to take the city from the Spartans. And Xenophon rushes in, and Anaxibius is very embarrassed. He has to hop in a, a fishing boat, Xenophon says, and, and ride, sail up to the citadel. And uh, it's, a, it's a very tense standoff. And Xenophon is presented with a temptation here. So here's what, here's what happens. Xenophon walks up, and uh, reading here, As soon as the soldiers saw Xenophon, they're in the city of Byzantium now, Many of them rushed toward him and said, Now is your opportunity, Xenophon, to prove yourself a man. You have a city. You have triremes, battleships. You have money. You have this great number of men. Now, should you so wish, you would render us a great service, and we would make you great. So they're saying, Take charge. Fate is yours. And he replied, Desiring to quiet them down, your advice is certainly good, and I shall do as you say. But if this is what you long for, ground your arms in line of battle with all speed. Then he proceeded to pass along this order himself, and he bade the others send it on to ground their arms in a battle line. 
and the men acted as their own marshals, and within a short time the hoplites had fallen into line eight deep, and the peltasts had gotten into position on either wing. The place where they were, indeed, is a most excellent one for drawing out a line of troops, being the so-called Thracian Square, which is free of houses and level. Uh, so, essentially, he tells them all to muster up. He's basically dealing with a furious mob, wanting them to, uh, wanting him to lead them onto glory. And he needs to calm them down fast, or things are going to get really bad. And this is really smart what he does. He gets them in a goal-directed frame of mind. He channels that chaotic energy first into order. He doesn't try to dissuade them yet. He's going to do that in a second. Then he makes a speech, and I won't read the whole thing, but here's how it starts. As soon as their arms were grounded and they had quieted down, Xenophon called the troops together and spoke as follows. That you are angry, fellow soldiers, and believe you are outrageously treated in being so deceived, I do not wonder. So first, affirm the emotion, yeah? But if we indulge our anger by taking vengeance for this deception upon the Lacedaemonians who are here, upon the Spartans, and by sacking the city, which is in no way to blame, consider the results that will follow. So they basically want him to, you know, pillage the city and take control of it. Consider the results that will follow. He says, we shall be declared to be at war with the Lacedaemonians and their allies. And so he goes on, and you can kind of imagine what he says here. The Spartans are, again, the hegemonic power in all of Greece right now. Do you think we have a shot against the Spartans? Like, if we hold one city, we're going to be at war with them. They have a hundred cities. And so he gets through his speech, and he uh, gives his proposal at the end. And now it is my opinion that we should send messengers to Anaxibius and say to him, We have not made our way into the city to do any violence, but to obtain some good thing from you if we can, or if that is not possible, at least to show that we go forth, not because we are deceived, but because we are obedient. So, I mean, essentially, I, the background there is there was some kind of trickery involved in getting them. He, and Exibius calls them out of the city, and he says he's going to muster them and deliver a message to them. But they realize that this is actually what happened, now that I recall. that the, They realize that the Spartans are int intending to basically lock them out of the city as soon as they're all gone. So that's... That's when they say, no, no way, Jose. And, uh, and so Xenophon's proposing, let's, let's tell Anaxibius, we'll leave the city, but you need to treat us as like free agents and not as cattle or something. And the soldiers approve of this plan. And they send emissaries to the Spartan admiral and they manage to defuse the situation. They, they get out of the city peacefully after getting some promises from Anaxibius. So now, at last, Xenophon's peacefully gotten them out of the city, which is what the Spartans wanted, to get them out of Byzantium. And he's ready to go. You know, he, he, he's been wanting to go home for a while. You remember last episode, he was sacrificing to Hercules the leader to see if he should go, and Hercules said, no, stay. But now he's thinking, all right, I can finally leave. And... The army's starting to break up at the fringes here. He, he says people are leaving. Guys are just going to the various cities up and down the coast. They're selling their armor and their spears just to get enough fare to pay their way back home. People are, people are kind of getting out of there. And the mood is everyone's trying to figure out what's going on. And there's just not a lot of clarity on the part of the Spartans as to what exactly they intend for the army. And I think as you're reading it, Xenophon does a pretty good job of making you feel like you're there and you're getting all these contradictory messages from the Spartans and you generally have no idea what they want or intend for you and you're trying to make the, de the best decision yourself. You know, it's not really clear what they should do. Should I try to make it home on my own? Should I stay with the army I've been fighting with? You know, home sounds very good, but... It might be risky to go home all alone. 
Maybe I should try to stay on with the army as a mercenary, make more money to take back to the family. There's also safety in numbers. So this is what's going through a lot of the men's heads. And meanwhile, to make things even more confusing for the army and for the reader, right at this moment, as the soldiers have left the city, there's a changing of the leadership. The Spartans typically cycle through city governors and admirals every year. So, so there's a new admiral coming to replace Anaxibius. And there's a new governor of Byzantium coming to replace Xenophon's friend. But Xenophon gets a message as he's getting ready to leave from Anaxibius. This is a few days later. And this is the admiral who's on his way out. He says, all right, you don't want to go to the Chersonese. Well, bring the army across to Asia. I have work for you now. And he wants Xenophon to be the one to make sure they make it across. And if he doesn't do that, the implication is the Spartans are going to hold him responsible, you know, for the failure. So Xenophon is kind of stuck and he starts leading the army to a crossover point, Perinthus. Meanwhile, this guy, Suthes, the Thracian, who we'll come back to, he, he comes again and he asks, hey, why don't you guys come fight for me? And they, they turn him down again. Xenophon's trying to follow the Spartan orders. But then they're, they're about to cross over the straits, following the orders of this one Spartan, Anaxibius. And then this other Spartan, the, gover the new governor of Byzantium, a guy named Aristarchus, he sails up and says, if you guys try to cross, I'm going to sink you. <laughs> He's uh, in a battleship. And it seems, Xenophon says, that he had worked out some new arrangement with Pharnabazus, governor of uh, Asia, on the other side there. And he didn't want to upset Pharnabazus, so now he's saying that plan C is canceled. We're on plan D now. And the Greeks are getting really fed up here. So Xenophon thinks at last, well, maybe this Suthis guy is worth a shot. So he sacrifices, and the gods tell him, yep, this is a good plan. Let's, let's check it out. And this will be a big, big cycle that occupies most of the chapter. Suthis the Thracian. So first, Xenophon's going to go with a couple of the captains to just respond to Suthis and kind of check it out. They're going to lead the army behind. And there's this really cool scene. Xenophon goes with these officers. Suthis is camped in the hinterland, about six miles away. So Suthis is a, a Thracian. And so here's a reminder who the Thracians are. The Thracians are, at least they're the Greeks. That's the Greeks term for basically the peoples living in this southeast corner of the Balkans. It's a very large area encompassing most of modern Bulgaria, some of modern Greece, uh, the, the European sections of Turkey today. That's all Thrace. And the Greeks call all these people Thracians. They seem to be related, uh, but there, there's various tribes and there's some kind of unity among them, a king that has authority of some sort over the other tribal princes, but the Greeks sort of think of them as a, a wild, heavy-drinking, warlike, uh, less civilized people that are nice to make friends with, but uh, definitely not Greeks. So here's, here's, what, here's what Xenophon says. They set off by night to visit Suthes' army, 60 stadia away, about six miles. And when they had gotten near it, he came upon watchfires, Xenophon, uh, with no one about them. At first, he supposed that Suthes had shifted his camp to some other place, but when he became aware of a general uproar and heard Suthes's followers signaling to one another, he comprehended that the reason Suthes had his watchfires kindled in front of the guards was in order that the guards might remain unseen in the darkness as they were, so that no one could tell either how many they were or where they were. While on the other hand, people who were approaching could not escape notice, but would be visible in the light of the fires. When he did see the guards, 
he sent forward the interpreter he chanced to have and bade them tell Suthes that Xenophon had come and desired to meet with him. They asked whether he was the Athenian, the one from the army, and when Xenophon made the reply that he was the man, they leaped up and hastened off. And a little afterwards, about two hundred Peltasts appeared. They took Xenophon and his party, and they proceeded to conduct them to Suthes. He was in a tower and well guarded, and all around the tower were horses ready bridled. For out of fear he gave his horses their fodder by day, and by night kept them ready bridled to guard himself with. For there was a story that in the time gone by, Teres, an ancestor of Suthes, being in this region with a large army, lost many of his troops and was robbed of his baggage train at the hands of the people of this neighborhood. They were the Thunians, and were said to be the most warlike of all men, especially by night. End quote. So there, they're brought to Suthis. Xenophon speaks. He has to explain. You see, it didn't make sense earlier, but now it does make sense. So here we are. We're interested in your offer. And... They ask Suthis, now, if we join with you, what use do you intend to make of the army? And I'll read you what he says here. Then Suthis spoke as follows. My Sades was my father, and his realm embraced the Melanditai, the Thunians, and the Tranipsi. Now, when the affairs of the Odrysians fell into a bad state, my father was driven out of this country. I guess the Odrysians are his tribe, which is kind of a, one of the dominant tribes. So my father was driven out of this country, and thereafter he got sick and died, while I, the son, was brought up as an orphan at the court of Medokos, the present king. When I became a young man, however, I could not endure to live with my eyes turned toward another's table. So I sat myself down on the same seat with Medokos, as a suppliant, and besought him to give me as many men as he could, in order that I might inflict whatever harm I could upon those who drove us out, and might live without turning my eyes toward his table. Thereupon he gave me the men and the horses that you will see for yourselves as soon as day has come. And now I live with them, plundering my own ancestral land. But if you should join me, I think that with the aid of the gods, I could easily recover my realm. It is this that I ask from you. Well, that's a pretty good story, isn't it? Hard to say no to that. And Xenophon doesn't say this here. But as it goes on, it becomes clear he really develops a fondness for Suthis and admiration. And I, I think you could see why. Trying to recover his ancestral lands from people who drove him out and so Xenophon says, well, very well, what should I tell the men that you are offering as a reward if we decide to accept your offer? And he promises them money. Each soldier is supposed to get a Sizicene or a Sizikine or Kizikine. It's a, it's a kind of coin from Sizikus or Kizikos. It's a silver coin worth about 25 drachmas, which is like 25 days wage. Uh, so every month they're going to get a scene. So that's, that's pretty good pay. The captains and generals are going to get more. He even promises them also land and oxen and other stuff in kind. So he'll give them land if they want it. And he even promises Xenophon a fort, several forts, in fact, on the seacoast. And Xenophon here is probably thinking to himself about Alcibiades, which is a hero that we'll get to eventually in the Cost of Glory podcast, another great colorful figure from Plutarch's lives came up a little bit in the life of Lysander Alcibiades ended his days in this area he had a lot of friends among the Thracians and he had some forts along the Thracian coasts and and Suthis actually probably knew Alcibiades there's a passage in one of the ancient historians where Alcibiades boasts about being friends with a certain Suthis and it's probably this guy and 
I'll just read you another passage that shows Suthis' character here. So they've got these, these offers from Suthis. But, said Xenophon, if we make this attempt and do not succeed because of some intimidation on the part of the Lacedaemonians, will you receive into your country anyone who may wish to leave the army and come to you? And Suthis replied, Nay, more than that, I will make you my brothers, table companions, sharers to the uttermost in all that we may find ourselves able to acquire. And to you, Xenophon, I will also give my daughter. And if you have a daughter, I will buy her after the Thracian fashion. And I will give you for a residence Byzanthi, the fairest of all the places I have upon the sea coast. So, a lot of, lot of friendly feelings here. Well, Xenophon and the captains go back. They present the offer to the army. The army likes it. And they vote to go to Suthes, the Thracian. And Aristarchus, the Spartan governor of Byzantium, he sends some emissaries to try to persuade them not to go. He gets word of this. Please stick around. I've got work for you. And they just completely ignore him. They're pretty fed up with the Spartans. and They're waffling at this point. And I think it's interesting when you think about Lysander here. Where's Lysander? Probably being detained away from the scene right now. He's dealing with internal enemies. Agesilaus is not yet the king. You know, if you are hip to the other lives that we've discovered in the, in the cost of glory. So it seems that Sparta is kind of kind of rudderless on the edges of their empire here. The man on the spot, whoever it be, Anaxibius, Aristarchus, Cleander, you know, the man on the spot is going to make the decisions, and it's not always clear what the general central policy is of the Spartans, probably, to these guys. And I, I think this is something to keep in mind. You know, when you expand really fast, like the Spartans did after winning this war, you know, there are big challenges in giving people with huge new responsibilities clear instructions, for one. Um, you know, I saw somebody post the other day about, you know, if you scale a business, you don't want to do it in a linear fashion. It's best to do it in a kind of like stepwise fashion. You know, once you get to a certain size, you want to take a breather and, you know, address all the problems that have occurred through growth before you move on to a next phase of growth. Make sure you kind of tighten the screws. And the Spartans have really expanded quite fast here, and they seem not, not to have done that very well in all cases as here. So anyway, the, the Greeks ignore the Spartans, or the, you know, the, the, the mercenaries ignore the Spartans, and Xenophon is going to bring up this fact later. Um, remember, the Spartans know the names of the people leading the army, and they're going to hold the leaders responsible for whatever actions the army takes. But anyway, they, they go and they join up with Suthis. They make this deal, and this is going to be really important. And the plan is basically to go around with Suthis, capturing villages, plundering and pillaging, and the Greeks get to keep whatever they need as far as like basics of food and basics. That's how they're going to get their food, you know, seizing sheep and so on, and grain and, you know, like we've seen with the local delicacies. But anything extra that they get, their arrangement is they surrender that to Suthis, and he'll use that to sell it and get their pay for them. So they say, okay, we'll do that. Now, once they all arrive at Suthis' camp, he thinks, well, it's time to seal the deal here. He invites the generals and the captains to dinner. And here's where Xenophon meets a guy that he ends up really not liking, and it's, the guy ends up being kind of an important character. His name is Heraclides. He's a Greek from a nearby Greek colony in the area, Maronea, which is on the coast nearby. So he's a kind of an interpreter, a cultural mediator, the sort of guy that we've met before, buzzing around the court of the great man and uh, helping him out with this and that, helping him interface. And so as the captains are all outside the doors of Suthes' feasting hall, Heraclides comes up to every one of the Greeks one by one, and he says, Hey, you know, you really should think about giving Suthes a gift. It's the Thracian custom, and, well, Suthes, 
he's going to be a big man someday, especially now that you guys are fighting with him. So it's a good investment. You know, he'll know how to reward his friends. And so he's kind of pressuring them to, to you know, pitch in a little more. And uh, however, this pr- poses a problem for Xenophon because, quote, he came up to Xenophon also and said to him, you are a citizen of a very great state and your name is very great with Suthis. Perhaps you will expect to obtain fortresses in his land, as others among your countrymen have done, referring to Alcibiades there, probably, and many others, maybe, uh, and territory. It is proper, therefore, for you to honor Suthis in the most magnificent way. It is out of good will to you that I give this advice, for I am quite sure that the greater the gifts you bestow upon this man, the greater the favors that you will receive at his hands." Upon hearing this, Xenophon was dismayed, for he had come across from Perium with nothing but a slave and money enough for his traveling expenses, so he doesn't have any gift to give. But I'll, uh, I'll continue on here, telling you about the feast, which follows immediately after this. I think this is interesting to understand the mood here. When they came in for dinner, the noblest of the Thracians who were present the generals and the captains of the Greeks and whatever embassy from any state was there, the dinner was served with the guests seated in a circle. Then three-legged tables were brought in for the whole company. These were about 20 in number, full of meat, cut up into pieces, and there were great loaves of leavened bread fastened with skewers to the pieces of meat. The tables were placed especially opposite the strangers in each case, for it was customary among the Thracians. And then, Suthes was the first to do the following. Picking up the loaves which were laid out, he would break them into small pieces and throw the pieces around to whomever he pleased, following the same fashion with the meat also, and leaving himself only enough for a mere taste. So I guess he's in the circle and he's walking around and kind of kind of tossing them to people and it's very symbolic if he you know picks you now, then the others also who had tables placed opposite them Thracians set about doing the same thing but a certain Arcadian named Aristas <laughs> who was uh, a terrific eater the, the Greek word there is kind of funny Fagain Denos he's just uh Fagain Denos is like, he's very skilled at eating. About a, a great speaker, you would say. Legain Denos, he's, he's, he's terrifying, ter- terrific at, at speaking. Well, anyway, so this guy, Aristus, he would have none of this throwing about, but he grabbed in his hand a loaf as big as a three-quart measure. I guess that's pretty big. He put some pieces of meat on his knees and he proceeded to dine. They carried round horns of wine, and all took them. So there's your local delicacies. But Aristas, when the cupbearer came and brought him his horn, said to the man, after observing that Xenophon had finished his dinner, Give it to him, for he's already at leisure, but I'm not as yet. When Suthis heard the sound of his voice, he asked the cupbearer what the man was saying. And the cupbearer, who understood Greek, told him, So there was an outburst of laughter. And I have really looked at this passage many times and I still can't quite figure out what's funny about what this guy said. But uh, I think, uh, you know, it's funny that he's just uh, just gorging himself contrary to custom and it's kind of inappropriate. But ah, ha ha, they all kind of have a good laugh and it diffuses the tension so that's, that's kind of a relief, probably, for the dinner guests, embarrassed about this friend of theirs. When the drinking was well underway, there came in a Thracian with a white horse, and taking a full horn of wine, he said, I drink your health, Suthes, and present to you this horse. On his back pursuing, you shall catch whomever you choose, and retreating, you shall not fear the enemy." Another brought in a boy and presented him in the same way with a toast to the health of Suthes, while another presented clothes for his wife. Timasion, that's uh, one of the Greek captains, also drank his health and presented to him 
a silver bowl and a carpet worth ten minas. Then one Gnesippus, an Athenian, rose and said that it was an ancient and most excellent custom that those who had possessions should give to the king for honor's sake, and that those who had not, the king should give to them. That so, he continued, I too may be able to bestow gifts upon you and do you honor. So that, that was this one guy's idea of how to, you know, deal with this fact that he didn't have anything to give. So why don't you give me a gift so I can give it back to you? It's kind of, kind of clever. And as for Xenophon, he was at a loss to know what he should do. For he chanced, as one held in honor, to be seated on the stool nearest to Suthi's. So this is very, very awkward for him. And Heraclides directed the cupbearer to proffer him the horn. So this is the, you know, the local intermediary guy who's giving them all this advice. And, you know, you can imagine him kind of like looking at Xenophon and grinning. What are you going to do now, buddy? Then Xenophon, who already, as it happened, had been drinking a little, arose courageously after taking the horn. So he's uh, got some liquid confidence here. And he says, And I, Suthis, give you myself and these my comrades to be your faithful friends. And not one of them do I give against his will, but all are even more desirous than I of being your friends. And now they are here asking you for nothing more, but rather putting themselves in your hands and willing to endure toil and danger on your behalf. With them, if the gods so will, you will acquire great territory, recovering all that belonged to your fathers, and gaining yet more. And you will acquire many horses and many men and fair women. And these things you will not need to take as plunder, but my comrades of their own accord shall bring them before you as gifts. Well, that went well. Up rose Suthis, drained the horn with Xenophon, and joined him in sprinkling the last drops, which is a custom of theirs. After this, there came in musicians blowing upon horns, such as they use in giving signals, and playing upon trumpets of raw oxhide, not only measured notes, but music like that of a harp. Wow. I have no idea what that would be like. And Suthis himself got up raised a war cry and sprang aside very nimbly as though avoiding a missile. There entered after this also a company of buffoons. So they they brought in the clowns after that. Okay. So that was the feast. And so they go on and start raiding. I'm going to skip a lot here. That's interesting and worth reading. Uh, But here's a little sample of the conditions they're fighting in at one point. So they're fighting in the winter. uh, So it's... uh, one of the reasons why it was kind of hard for them to get out of this area on their own. It's not the sailing season. So they're fighting in the winter. Here's the conditions. There was deep snow on the plain, and it was so cold that the water which they carried in for dinner and their wine in the jars would freeze. And many of the Greeks had their noses and ears frostbitten. Then it became clear why the Thracians wear fox skin caps on their heads and over their ears, and tunics, not merely about their chests, but also round their thighs, and why, when on horseback, they wear long cloaks reaching down to their feet instead of mantles. But things are going well. They're, they're having a great time. It's a very successful campaign, raiding, taking Suthis' ancestral lands back. Now, one interesting episode that I want to discuss here, I think it shows you how hard to figure out when to trust people in these situations that you're trying to negotiate with people in. Suthis and Xenophon are smart, war-hardened guys. I mean, they're no fools. Um, But so they trust these people. They've uh, basically captured some lands from some people. And here's what happens. Not many days had passed after this when the Thracians on the mountain came down and entered into negotiations with Suthis in regard to a truce and hostages. And Xenophon came and told Suthis that his men were in bad quarters and the enemy were close at hand. They're basically in these villages that they've just captured from the Thracians. 
And he would be better pleased, Xenophon said, to bivouac in the open, in a strong position, rather than in the houses, and run the risk of being destroyed. But Suthis bade him have no fear, and showed him hostages that had come from the enemy. He's like, hey, look, the en enemy gave us these hostages. Maybe, actually, these are like old men hostages. <laughs> so, meanwhile, some of the people on the mountain came down and actually requested Xenophon himself to help them obtain the truce. He agreed to do so, told them to have no fear, and gave them his word that they would suffer no harm if they were obedient to Suthis. But they, as it proved, were talking about this matter merely in order to spy out the situation. All this happened during the day, but in the night that followed, the Thunians issued from the mountain and made an attack. Remember, these are the Thunians who are the most terrifying warriors, especially at night. And the master of each separate house acted as a guide to that house where the Greeks are staying. For in the darkness, it would have been difficult to find the houses in these villages in any other way, for each house was surrounded by a paling made of great stakes to keep in the cattle. When they had reached the doors of a particular house, some would throw in javelins, others would lay on with their clubs, which they carried, so it was said to knock off the heads of hostile spears, and still others would be setting the house on fire, meanwhile calling Xenophon by name and bidding him come out and be killed. Or else, they said, he would be burned up then and there. And now fire was already showing through the roof, and Xenophon and his men inside the house had equipped themselves with breastplates and were furnished with shields and swords and helmets. When Silanus the Machistian, a lad of about eighteen years, gave a signal with the trumpet, and on that instant... They leaped forth with swords drawn, and so did the Greeks from the other houses. Then the Thracians took to flight, swinging their shields around behind them as it was their custom, and some of them who tried to jump over the palings were captured, hanging in the air with their shields caught in the stakes, while others missed entirely the ways that led out and were killed. Then the Greeks continued the pursuit till they were outside the village. Some of the Thunians, however, turned around in the darkness and hurled javelins at men that were running along past a burning house throwing out of the darkness toward the light, and they wounded Hieronymus the Euodian, a captain, and Theogenes the Locrian, also a captain. No one, however, was killed. But some men had clothes and baggage burned up. Meanwhile, Suthes came to their aid with seven horsemen of his front line and his Thracian trumpeteer, trumpeter, excuse me, and from the instant... He learned of the trouble through all the time that he was hurrying to the rescue. Every moment his horn kept sounding. And the result was that this also helped to inspire fear in the enemy. When he did arrive, he clasped their hands and said that he had supposed he should find many of them slain. So they managed to save that situation. But after this, Heraclides gets back. So... Suthes sent Heraclides, this Greek intermediary, to go and basically sell the booty that they won from the raids to get the cash, to get the coin, to pay the soldiers. And now he comes back and he's saying, well, this is all the money I got and it's just not enough to, to cover the, the time that they've been fighting together. And Xenophon knows how much this guy went off with and he sees how much he came back with and he basically thinks okay something's missing here something's wrong here and here's what he says Suthi's also paid over the wages of the troops but only for 20 days of the month that had now passed so about two-thirds of their pay for Heraclides said that he had not obtained any more than that from his sale Xenophon was angered at this and said to him with an oath, It seems to me, Heraclides, that you are not caring for Suthes' interests as you should. For if you were, you would have brought back with you our wages in full, even if you had to borrow something, in case you could not do it in any other way, or to sell your own clothes. So this made Heraclides not only angry, but fearful that he might be banished from the favor of Suthes, 
and from that day he slandered Xenophon before Suthes to the best of his ability. As for the soldiers, they held Xenophon to blame for their not having received their pay. And Suthes, on the other hand, was angry with him because he was insistent in demanding their pay for the soldiers. Hitherto he had continually been mentioning the fact that upon his return to the coast he was going to give Xenophon, Byzanthi, and Ganos, and Neontychos, which are fortresses. But from this time on, he did not allude to a single one of these places again. For Heraclides had put in this slanderous suggestion with the rest, that it was not safe to be giving over fortresses to a man who had a force of troops. So Xenophon's kind of in this awkward position of... He's basically, you know, advocating for the interests of the men. And the men think that he's on Suthis' team. They, they think he's getting some kind of a special deal, probably. Just typical Greek suspicion of their leaders, uh, which Xenophon insists he's not. But things sour from there. So Xenophon is kind of on, on the wrong side of both Suthis and his subordinates. Um, this unfortunate middleman position that that's sort of his duty to to uphold and and Heraclides this uh, intermediary he, he tries to go around to the other generals and get them to lead the army without Xenophon and they say hey, no way we are not I would rather fight five months without pay than fight without Xenophon as my leader that one of them says that uh, so they keep on fighting in the, under the current arrangement, but it's tense now. But they keep on fighting, and they get to a place on the Black Sea coast. Again, it's kind of on the edge of civilization from the Greek perspective. And I think this is a fascinating glimpse into what this area is like. They continue the march with Suthis and keeping the Pontus upon the right through the country of the millet-eating Thracians, whoever they are, as they are called, they arrived at Salmidesus, which is on the Black Sea coast. Here, many vessels sailing to the Pontus, it's probably in Bulgaria today. Here, many vessels sailing to the Pontus run aground and are wrecked, for there are shoals that extend far and wide. And the Thracians who dwell on this coast have boundary stones set up, and each group of them plunder the ships that are wrecked within their own limits. But in earlier days, before they fixed the boundaries, it was said that in the course of their plundering, many of them used to be killed by one another. So they were they're fighting with each other to the death sometimes over who gets to plunder these shipwrecks. Uh, but here they found, here, here were found by the Greeks, great numbers of beds and boxes, quantities of written books and an abundance of all the other articles that ship owners carry in wooden chests. So maybe that shows that people are trading these things, right? There's Greek colonies all around the Black Sea, up even towards Crimea. Beds and boxes and, and books. You wonder what copies of what books there were in that payload. History, military tactics great speeches, philosophy. I bet that there were some lost works in there that we'd love to have today. Maybe some plays of Sophocles. We'll never know. So they finish up their raiding there in the, on the Black Sea coast, and then they return back. As for pay, though, continuing with Xenophon, there was none to be seen as yet. And not only did the soldiers entertain very hard feelings toward Xenophon, but Suthes no longer felt kindly toward him. And whenever Xenophon came and wanted to have a meeting with him, it would straightway be found that Suthes had engagements in abundance. He's always busy now. Xenophon has kind of become the wet blanket for Suthes. He just doesn't want to see him. It's really sad. But... Suthis, by this point, has captured most of his ancestral lands back, thanks to you know, Xenophon and the Greeks. And now, two Spartans arrive at the army's camp. 
Spartans have finally gotten their act together, and they want to formally invite the Greek mercenaries to help them fight a new war with Tissaphernes, governor of Lydia. They're offering good pay, and, you know, the army, they know about Tissaphernes. Do you remember Tissaphernes? He's the man who tricked Clearchus and the other generals into joining him at a feast back in book two, after the, uh, the battle and um, in which Cyrus fell. And then he had them arrested and executed and just de- deceived them and uh, tried to wage war on them. So they hate Tissaphernes. So this has looked very interesting to them. Get some revenge on Tissaphernes, get paid. And uh, they, the Spartans approach Tissuthes and they say, look, you're done with the army now. They want to keep working. You can let them go on good terms. They can keep getting paid from us. We can get their help. This is a a win-win-win. And here's what Suthis does. He replied that he would deliver up, deliver it up, the army that is, and that he desired to be their friend and ally. Well, who wouldn't want to be the friend and ally of the Spartans? He also invited them to dinner and entertained them magnificently. Xenophon, however, he did not invite, nor any of the other generals. When the Lacedaemonians asked at dinner, so Xenophon's probably getting this from them afterwards, but so he, he kind of gets the scoop on what was said at this dinner. When the Lacedaemonians asked what sort of a man Xenophon was, Suthis replied that he was not a bad fellow on the whole, but he was a friend of the soldiers, and on that account, things went the worst for him. And the Spartan said, He plays the demagogue, you mean, with the men? Exactly that, said Heraclides. Well, said they, the Spartans, he won't go so far, will he, as to oppose us in the matter of taking the army away? Why, said Heraclides, if you gather the men together and promise them their pay, they will hurry after you, paying scant heed to him. How then, they said, could we get them together? Tomorrow morning, Heraclides replied, we will take you to them. And I know, he continued, that as soon as they catch sight of you, they will hurry together with all eagerness. And so ended this day. So they're getting uh, some messages about Xenophon at this feast. Heraclides uh, affirming this uh, with this word demagogue. It's a highly charged word. This is the idea that the Spartans really don't like demagogues. Demagogue means persuasive public speaker, good at kind of rabble rousing. They associate demagogues with democracies, with the Athenians. Bad, bad, bad. Disorderly. So 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 Xenophon is really kind of becoming a getting under a cloud of suspicion here. Going on here. The next day, Suthes and Heraclides conducted the Laconians to the army. The Spartan ambassadors, there's two of them. And the troops gathered together. And the two Laconians said, The Lacedaemonians have resolved to make war upon Tissaphernes, the man who wronged you. So if you will come with us, you will punish your enemy. And besides, each one of you will receive a derrick a month, which is decent pay. Each captain twofold, each general fourfold. The soldiers were delighted to hear these words. And straight away, one of the Arcadians got up to accuse Xenophon. Now, Suthes was also present, for he wanted to know what would be done, and was standing within hearing distance along with an interpreter, although he could really understand for himself most of what was said in Greek. Thereupon, this Arcadian said, For our part, Lacedaemonians, we should have been with you a long time ago. If Xenophon had not talked us over and led us off to this region, where we have never ceased campaigning by night or day through an awful winter while he gets the fruit of our toils. For Suthes has enriched him personally, while he defrauds us of our pay. So for myself, if I could see this fellow stoned to death as punishment for having dragged us about as he has done, I should consider that I had my pay, and should feel no anger over the toils I have endured. After this speaker, another arose and talked in the same way, then another. So, this turns into a bit of a crisis. Xenophon's kind of on trial. Surprise, once again. Because 
you know, despite his best efforts, ever since they left Byzantium, he's been acting as their de facto leader. So now he has to defend himself in front of the Spartans, in front of Suthis too, and in front of the entire army. So this is a challenging pro- proposition and, uh, you know, involves a lot of frank speaking. He's going to have to speak very frankly about his relationship with Suthis and how it's gone wrong. And he does defend himself in great detail and at great length. And I, I won't read it all. It's quite long. But the takeaway is, I think, if you find yourself accused, what Xenophon does here is take a deep breath and calmly lay out the facts and don't hold back just because you're going to offend somebody, obviously. This is why the speech is so long. Xenophon goes over all the decisions that he made up to the point that we're at now, and he kind of puts you there with him, and he explains why he was taking reasonable action on every case. And basically, his version of the story is he's always been siding with the army's best interest. He's refused, despite many opportunities, to get any private advantage for himself, any conflict of interest with the army's interests. He didn't take any presents from Suthis. He rejected the Spartans and treaties earlier when they seemed to be made in bad faith, but he, this was the, the army voted on that, on, on those decisions. So like a lot of the decisions is really the army's decision. They took votes. Um, and you know, he was trying to leave to go home and be done with all this, but he kept getting roped back in. So, you know, by the end of the speech, uh, he comes off looking pretty good. And another point that this illustrates is Plutarch observes in a treatise that he entitled How to Praise Yourself Without Offending Others, that if you are accused unjustly, in a way, that's a golden opportunity. Because this is one of the One of the main ways that you can be in a position to to kind of tell a great story about yourself, to praise yourself without giving any offense, especially if your life is on the line. It it just makes the most sense to give the most compelling story about yourself. Um, The defense speech in a courtroom case is the rhetorically stronger position. The great Roman orator Cicero recognized this. Most of his speeches were defense speeches. And Xenophon really is being attacked here, right? A a few envious men have stood up and said, we're fine if the Spartans want to stone you to death. Incredible. And I'll just read you the last part of Xenophon's rather long speech. The uh, final part of an oration is called the pear oration. So he's, he's winding to his conclusion here. You hold me in your power then. And not as a captive that you have taken in flight or as a runaway slave. And if you do what you are proposing, stone me, be sure that you will have slain a man who has passed many sleepless nights for your sake, who has endured many toils and dangers with you, both when it was his duty and when it was not, who has also, by the graciousness of the gods, set up with you many trophies of victory over the barbarians and who, in order to prevent your becoming enemies to any one among the Greeks, has exerted himself to the very utmost of his power in opposition to you. In fact, you are now free to journey in security wherever you may choose, whether by land or by sea. And you, at the moment when such abundant freedom is evident for you, when you are sailing to the very place where you have long been eager to go and the mightiest are suing for your aid when pay is within sight and the Lacedaemonians who are deemed the most powerful leaders have come to lead you, do you, I say, think that now is the proper time to put me to death with all speed? It was not so, surely, in the days when we were in the straits. O oh, you who remember better than all other men. Nay, Then you called me father, and you promised to keep me forever in memory as a benefactor. Not by any means, however, are these men who have now come after you wanting in judgment. Therefore, I imagine they also think none the better of you for behaving in this manner toward me. With these words, he ceased speaking. And I'll just uh, give you the Spartan response here. Then Carminus the Lacedaemonian arose and said, Well... 
By the twin gods, men, I at any rate think you are unjust in being angry with this man, for I can bear witness for him myself. When I and Polynicus asked Suthes about Xenophon to learn what sort of man he was, Suthes had no fault to find with him save that, as he said, he was too great a friend of the soldiers. And on that account, he added, things went the worse for him, both so far as we the Lacedaemonians were concerned and on his own account. So he stopped speaking. After him, Eurylochus of Lucy arose, one of the other people in the army. Yes, and I believe, men of Lacedaemon, that you first of all ought to assume leadership over us in this enterprise, exacting our pay from Suthes, whether he will or not, so that you should not take us away until that is done. So Suthes owes them quite a bit of back pay at this point. And Polycrates the Athenian said at the instigation of Xenophon, <laughs> Look you, fellow soldiers, I see Heraclides also present here. The man who took in charge the property which we had won by our toil and then sold it and then did not pay over the proceeds either to Suthes or to us, but stole the money and is keeping it for himself. If we are wise, therefore, we shall lay hold of him. For this fellow, said he, is no Thracian, but a Greek, and yet he is wronging Greeks. Upon hearing these words, Heraclides was exceedingly terrified, and going up to Suthes, he said, And if we are wise, we shall go away from here and get out of the power of these fellows. So they mounted their horses and went riding off into their own camp. So they, they scram. Uh, so the army agrees to fight for the Spartans here, and I'm going to oversimplify, basically. There are some other complications, but yeah, for our purposes, you know, the army is owed some money from Suthes and the Spartan emissaries here, they think it's best to have Xenophon go and try to negotiate to get their back pay from Suthes. So Xenophon rides out to Suthes for one final meeting. And this is kind of poignant. I think you can see in, in what I'm about to show you that there was a lot of good feeling here. And I'm just going to give you a couple of excerpts. This first one I like because uh, Xenophon drops some good wisdom on what the value of money versus the value of honor is. So, so Xenophon comes and he, once he gets there, when he had come, he said to Suthes, I am here, Suthes, not to present you any demand, but to show you, if I can, that you were wrong in getting angry with me because in the name of the soldiers I zealously demanded from you what you had promised them. For I believed that it was no less to your advantage to pay them than it was to theirs to get their pay. For in the first place, I know that next to the gods, it was these men who set you in a conspicuous position, since they made you king over a large territory and many people. Hence, it is not possible for you to escape notice, whether you perform an honorable deed or a base one. Now, it seems to me an important thing that a man in such a place should not be thought to have dismissed benefactors without gratitude. An important thing also to be well spoken of by 6,000 men. But most important of all, that you should by no means set yourself down as untrustworthy in whatever you say. For I see that the words of untrustworthy men wander here and there without results, without power, and without honor. But if men are seen to practice truth, their words, if they desire anything, have power to accomplish no less than force in the hands of other men. You know, in some, honesty is, uh, well, it's to your own advantage. It's, it's, it's a source of power. And if, trustworthy men here, if they wish to bring one to reason, I perceive that their threats can do this no less than present chastisement applied by others. And if such men make a promise to do any to anyone, they accomplish no less than others do by an immediate gift. And here, here's an interesting point. Recall for yourself what amount you paid to us in advance in order to obtain us as allies. You know it was nothing, but because you were trusted to carry out truthfully whatever you said, you induced that great body of men to take the field with you and to gain for you a realm 
worth not merely 30 talents, the sum which these men think they now ought to recover, but many times as much. First of all, then, your trustworthiness, the very thing which gained your kingdom for you, is being sold by you for this sum. So it's like he's saying your kingdom is surely worth more. Let's say like it's 100 talents at least or you know, 500 talents worth of land. And for a mere 30 talents, you know, you got that because of your goodwill, because people trusted you. Look at how valuable it is to be trusted. This is, this is a world before credit scores, right? Before actuarial, you know, calculations and uh, underwriting policies. And, and yet, I think the lesson still applies for, for, for business and life. Being trustworthy in any industry is a huge asset, and you don't want to throw that away for any price. And a little later on, he draws a clear contrast with Heraclides. And, and Heraclides is really the guy that he blames for giving Suthes, either giving him bad advice or leading him on the wrong course or deceiving him. And he says, quote, And yet Heraclides thinks that everything is but nonsense in comparison with possessing money by every means. But I believe, Suthes, that no possession is more honorable for a man, especially a commander, or more splendid than valor and justice and generosity. For he who possesses these things is rich because many are his friends, and rich because still others desire to become his friends. If he prospers, he has those who will rejoice with him, and if he meets with a mischance, he does not lack those who will come to his aid. It's not just about a transaction, right? This is the beauty of friendship. There's, there's real feeling and real commitment to, attached to it. And this is the strongest kind of asset you can have, a good friend, in Xenophon's eyes, at least. And here's what he says. But if you neither learned from my deeds that I was your friend from the bottom of my heart, the Greek there is ectes psuches philos ein, I was a friend from my soul. If you did not learn from my deeds that I was a friend from the bottom of my heart, nor are able to perceive this from my words, at any rate, give a thought to what the soldiers say. For you were present and heard what they who wished to censure me said. On the one hand, they accused me before the Lacedaemonians of regarding you more highly than I did the Lacedaemonians. While on their own account, they charged me with being more concerned that your affairs should be well than that their own should be. So, the soldiers were accusing me of being too close to you. Were they wrong? And uh, Xenophon ends his speech. And then he says, Upon hearing these words, Suthis cursed the man who was to blame for the fact that the soldiers' wages had not been paid long ago. And everybody suspected that Heraclides was that man. For I, said Suthis, never intended to defraud them. And I will pay over the money. Thereupon, Xenophon said again, Then since you intend to make payment, I now request you do it through me and not allow me to have on your account a different standing with the army now from what I had at the time when we came to you. And Suthis replied, But you will not be less honored among the soldiers on my account if you will stay with me, keeping only a thousand hoplites and... Besides, I will give over the fortresses to you and the other things that I promised. And Xenophon answered, This plan is not a possible one. So dismiss us. And Suthis had been asking this a few times earlier, actually. And he meant it, right? He really liked Xenophon. Then he realized his mistake. But it was too late. In great business partnerships that dissolve, sometimes you're able to part ways peaceably, like Bill Gates and Paul Allen. Sometimes it's more violent, like Andrew Carnegie and Henry Clay Frick. Thankfully, this one ends up being relatively peaceful, 
but it's still tragic for Suthis. You know, it didn't have to be that way. I think it's a cautionary tale about recognizing when you've got a good friend, not just someone who hangs out with you a lot and praises you, but a good man, and one who's probably going to turn out to be an influential person because of their good qualities, someone like Xenophon. And these kinds of people often don't mix well with bad friends like Heraclides, like with dishonest people. So, choose wisely. That's, I think, what Xenophon would want us to take away from this. And Suthi's hands over what he owed to the troops. I'm going to read one more little passage here that I think puts a good end on this story. And this is maybe where Xenophon could have ended it if he was just slightly sappier. But here's what he says. From there they sailed across to Lampsicus where Xenophon was met by Euclides, the Phliasian seer. And he's, he's got the whole army with him now. There's all the armies crossing. Uh, so he's got this seer with him. Where he meets this seer, Euclides, the son of Cleagoras, who painted the murals in the Lyceum. So this is, the guy's dad is a famous painter who painted the murals in this famous gym at Athens called the Lyceum where Aristotle would later found his school. How would you like your gym to be like that? To have a famous mural painted in it by a famous painter. Why isn't your gym like that? Why isn't my gym like that? All right. Uh, Euclides congratulated Xenophon upon his safe return and asked him how much gold he had got. He replied, swearing to the truth of his statement, that he would not even have enough money to pay his traveling expenses on the way home unless he should sell his horse and whatever he had about his person. And Euclides would not believe him. But when the Lampsakines sent gifts of hospitality to Xenophon and he was sacrificing to Apollo, he gave Euclides, the seer, a place beside him. And when Euclides saw the vitals of the victims, he's looking into the sacrifice here that the you know, the liver or the kidney or whatever. He said that he well believed that Xenophon had no money. Yes, the gods confirm that, uh, yes, you're telling the truth. I believe you didn't, you don't have any money. But I am sure, Euclides went on, that even if money should ever be about to come to you, some obstacle always appears. If nothing else, your own self in this, Xenophon agreed with him. Yep. Then Euclides said, Yes, Zeus the Merciful is an obstacle in your way. And he asked whether he had yet sacrificed to him. So some god is not ready for you to return yet. Um, and uh, Xenophon replied, No, I have not sacrificed to that god since I left home. And Euclides accordingly advised him to sacrifice just as he, just as he used to do. And he said that it would be to his advantage. And then, here we go, the next day, upon coming to Ophrinium, Xenophon proceeded to sacrifice, offering whole victims of swine after the custom of his fathers, and he obtained favorable omens. In fact, on that very day, Beton and Nausicleides, this is Spartans, arrived with money to give to the army and were entertained by Xenophon and they redeemed his horse, which he had sold at Lampsicus for 50 derricks. For they suspected that he had sold it out of lack of money, since they heard he was fond of the horse. And they gave it back to him, and they would not accept from him the price of it. Well, how he actually ends the Anabasis is uh, he describes one last daring raid on a local Persian nobleman in the area, and he does this with the soldiers almost for the fun of it. Um, but um, they, they, they complete the raid and they arrive with the army in Pergamon in Asia Minor. And the last sentence of the book here is, Meanwhile, Thibron arrived. This is the Spartan commander, the general commander of the Spartans. Thibron arrived and took over the army. And uniting it with the rest of his Greek forces, proceeded to wage war upon Tissaphernes and Pharnabazus. But I really like that horse restoration story. 
you know, the gods smiling on Xenophon in that small way for all his troubles. And I think that you could say that they smile on him all the way down through his life, his long life. If you were to say that, I think Xenophon would agree. And he'd, he would say that it was because he always consulted the gods in his most important decisions. He always thought about what would please them in his actions. In his opinion, the thing that pleased the gods the most was virtue, the kind of virtue that he learned from Socrates, and the kind of virtue which, to the best of his ability, he showed himself demonstrating in the Anabasis. And Xenophon didn't finish the campaign any richer than when he left. He was probably a whole lot poorer, actually, depending on how you reckoned it. He was exiled from his native Athens shortly after this, remember? But he lived another 40 years, retiring mostly to his estate that his Spartan friends gave him in the Peloponnese. And he found other sources of wealth and contentment in his long life, among them writing about the many experiences that he had and the many sufferings of the Greeks. And we've told some of his story, Xenophon's story, in the aftermath, in the biography of Agesilaus. Some of them are digressions in that. And if you haven't listened to that, I think that's probably the best place to go next for the what happens after this story. Xenophon himself actually picks up where he left off in the Anabasis in his other work, the Hellenica. He picks it up in uh, book two, I think, um, in the history of his times, the Hellenica, which is his general account of the Greek, Greek affairs from the end of the Peloponnesian War down to the Battle of Mantinea. And Xenophon wrote many other books worth reading. Memorabilia, The Recollections of Socrates. He wrote two books on horsemanship, a book on hunting with dogs, a book on state finances, a book on the Spartan Constitution, and some others. And maybe we'll treat some of them someday. But for now, thanks for listening. Let me know what you think, what you'd like more of. I'd love to get feedback from listeners. Stay strong. Stay ancient. Until next time. This is Alex Petkus.